intensify the mightiest military offensive in the history of man, required uninterrupted supply of ammunition and continuous delivery of the engines of war. necessities of a great army was the job of the services of supply. Whatever the obstacles, their work had to be done with speed and certainty. But even the miraculously fast job the supply service was performing in Western Europe was not always fast enough. We were weeks ahead of schedule, but in the important particular of supply capacity, we were badly behind. The roads, depots, and base installations required for the maintenance of continuous forward movement were still far to the rear of the front lines. In addition, the Allies port facilities on the French coast were extremely limited during the first months following the invasion. Our logistic formations had been confined in a very restricted area during the entire Battle of the Beachhead. The repair of Cherbourg had presented many difficulties. We began using the port in July, but it did not reach volume production until the middle of August. But the difficulties of supply, once our columns began their forward race, was a problem that required effective solution if we were to gain our full battle profit. To facilitate the unloading of supplies on the invasion beaches, the Allies had constructed two complete artificial harbors. The one in the American sector had been demolished by the hurricane two weeks after D-Day. The British artificial harbor survived and proved of inestimable value in the transfer ashore of the supplies so vital to Allied success in the Battle of Europe. But these ports were not nearly sufficient for Allied needs. These meager facilities could not support us indefinitely, and there was bound to be a line somewhere in the direction of Germany where we would be halted, if not by the action of the enemy, then because our supply lines had been strained to their elastic limit. One of the most vitally needed staples was oil. To keep a steady stream of that precious fluid pouring into France, a series of pipelines was laid between England and France, spanning the channel. The flexible pipe wound on drums for the first time, was deposited along the floor of the channel in a unique supply job called Operation Pluto. In all, 20 of these Pluto lines were laid, linking Great Britain and the French coast in the months after D-Day. Each drum carried as much as 70 miles of pipe, and when fully wound, weighed more than one and a half thousand tons, equal to the weight of a destroyer. From August 12, 1944, less than 10 weeks after the Normandy beaches were invaded by the Allies, until VE Day, more than 120 million gallons of gasoline flowed through the Pluto lines from Great Britain to the Allies on the continent. When these pipes were first laid in the channel, the destination of the gasoline was the coastal area of France, where it was pumped into storage tanks in the rear of the Allied position. The lifeblood of the Allied military organism was now ready for distribution to key sections of the front. Regardless, however, of the extraordinary efforts of the supply system, this remained our most acute difficulty. All along the front, the cry was for more gasoline. Every one of our spearheads could have gone farther and faster than they actually did. Nevertheless, we had to supply each force for its basic missions and for basic missions only. 
Getting the all-important supplies to the French coast was only half the problem. Delivering the goods to the men at the front was the toughest part of the job. The services of supply installed systems of truck transport by taking over main road routes in France and using most of these for one-way traffic. These were called red ball highways, on which trucks kept running continuously. Every vehicle ran at least 20 hours a day. Relief drivers were scraped up from every unit that could provide them, and the vehicles themselves were allowed to halt only for necessary loading, unloading, and servicing. Express began its operation on August 25, 1944, under the Motor Transport Brigade of the Transportation Corps. Its route was quickly extended and finally covered 700 miles, the longest one-way traffic artery in the world. Since the Red Ball Express operated 24 hours each day, most of the drivers served the same kind of continuous duty that the combat troops saw in the lines. During the autumn, the heavy rains crippled many trucks, whose transmissions became badly worn by excessive use of the low gear and the four-wheel drive. Experience had demonstrated that each of our reinforced divisions in active operation consumed about 600 to 700 tons of supplies per day. Our maintenance arrangements had to provide for the arrival of these amounts daily. In addition, we had to build up the reserves in troops, ammunition, and supplies that would enable us within a reasonable time to initiate deep offensives with the certainty that these could be sustained through an extended period of decisive action. One of the most important items of supply hauled by the Red Ball Express during the crucial autumn months of 1944 was food. With our supply lines lengthening and the enemy offering strong resistance, the delivery of rations on schedule at the front was a matter of the greatest concern to commanders. Our whole offensive depended on the maintenance of that delivery. As Allied forces penetrated farther and farther eastward in Europe, the transportation of that other vital commodity, oil, to the forward areas became an even greater problem. The system of pipelines was quickly extended to keep pace with the Allied advance. Five pipelines were built on the continent to carry gasoline, oil, and lubricants to Allied forces at the front. The largest of these was some 1,500 miles long. Altogether, the network of five lines totaled more than 3,000 miles. The thoroughness of the destruction of key transport arteries, both by Allied bombings and German demolitions, greatly complicated the monumental job of the services of supply. Allied engineers were faced with the task of restoring nearly 5,000 miles of double railway track, 2,000 miles of single track. The progress in the salvaging of Western Europe's railroads for Allied use was carefully noted by Generals Eisenhower and Bradford. The reconstruction of bridges, which, as major targets, had either been knocked out by the Allies or blown up by the retreating Nazis, was one of the most demanding jobs which fell to the overworked Army engineers. New portable Bailey bridges were erected with great speed by the Allies at many points, and pre-war bridges which had been damaged were hastily repaired. As the Army engineers rushed repairs on bridges, a major supply problem was lessened. To reduce dependence on roads, we brought in quantities of railway rolling stock to replace that destroyed earlier in the war. To do this expeditiously, railway engineers developed a simple scheme. They merely laid railway tracks in the bottom of LSTs and simply rolled the cars out of the ships. <laughs> 
Locomotives presented a more difficult problem, but they too were unloaded quickly, transferred without delay to the rails and ready to go into action. With the pressure from the front for additional supplies increasing, every available train was pressed into service at once. In the forward areas, the priority supplies were prepared for distribution to troop units. In the six months following D-Day, railroad development proceeded according to plan. Each train was loaded to capacity on its way to the front. Within two months after the Normandy landings, Hundreds of trips had been made by American trains, and more than 30,000 tons of freight had been transported to the front. The freight cars, which had carried their precious cargo of supplies to the forward areas, soon came to be used on their return runs for the transportation of wounded back to the beaches. A tremendous strain was placed upon our supply lines. Distance alone would have been enough to stop our spearheads, had we been dependent solely upon surface transport, efficient as it was. Distant and fast-moving columns were almost solely dependent upon air supply, and we kept transport planes constantly working in our supply system. They became known as flying boxcars, and were never more essential than in this stage of the war. Principal key to the solution of our supply problem was a major port still in German hands, the Belgian city of Antwerp. Within four days, elements of the British Second Army had driven close to 200 miles in a spectacular advance which took them into the prized city. Possession of this port, if usable, would solve our logistic problems for the entire northern half of our front. Not only was Antwerp the greatest port in Europe, but its location well forward toward the borders of Germany would reduce our rail and truck haulage to the point where supply should no longer be a limiting factor in the prosecution of the campaign at least in the northern sectors. On September 4th, Montgomery's armies entered Antwerp, and we were electrified to learn that the Germans had been so rapidly hustled out of the place that they had had no time to execute extensive demolitions. Antwerp is an inland port connected with the sea by the great Skelt estuary. The German defenses covering these approaches were still intact, and before we could make use of the port, we had the job of clearing out those defenses. Capture of the approaches to Antwerp was a difficult operation. The Skelt estuary was heavily mined, and the German forces on Valkyren Island and South Beveland Island completely dominated the water routes leading to the city. The battle for Valkyren Island raged on for eight days. The amphibious assault against Valkyren was carried out against some of the strongest local resistance we met at any coastline during the European operation. Final German resistance on the island was eliminated by November 9th. Following this spectacular and gratifying operation, Antwerp quickly became the northern bulwark of our entire logistical system. The first Allied ships arrived in Antwerp, ready to unload on November 26th. The supply problem in the Allied northern area was considerably brighter. The results of the seizure of Antwerp were felt along the entire front. The Germans began launching the frequently erratic V-2s against the city in mid-October. Even more frightening, though less devastating, were the older V-1 rocket bombs. The Nazis were fully aware of the importance to the Allies of the key port city and continued their crippling rocket bomb attacks throughout the winter. Numbers of civilians and soldiers were killed and communications and supply work were often interrupted, although usually only for brief periods. The civilian population of Antwerp sustained these attacks unflinchingly. <laughs> 
V-1s were often intercepted and exploded before they had a chance to land. Their shrill scream acted as a warning signal for Allied forward spotters outside Antwerp. Defensive measures against the V-1 soon attained a very high degree of efficiency. But even so, the threat of their arrival was always present at all hours of the day and night and in all kinds of weather. Radar was used to great advantage. at Antwerp was the chief objective of the Nazis' rocket bomb assaults. Damage to the harbor facilities was considerable. But Europe's greatest port was soon operating at capacity levels in support of British and American armies at Germany's frontier. The Allies planned to strengthen their forces at the front in preparation for the final great campaign to force the Nazis into unconditional surrender. Supplies arriving at Allied ports were unloaded and speeded on their way with not the slightest delay. All the men who contributed to the swift movement of these essential supplies to the battle line worked around the clock. The Allies were rolling in high gear on the road to Berlin. The battle of supply, though not yet won, was fast turning into another outstanding Allied victory. <laughs> <laughs> 